after preparing to live stream the meeting. So it's live, so we're good. What? Setting up your meeting for YouTube Live. I think it's right there. Here we go. It looks like it's YouTube Live right now. Yeah, it seems like there's a little delay to the system. Okay. So I think I'm ready to roll. I just want to let you know we're live on YouTube. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Many of us in the boating world um, enjoy the beautiful outdoors and the great recreational advantages of our sport, but we don't think as much as we ought to about the water that we sail in or power in and how to keep it super clean. With more and more of us out there all the time, uh, there's a temptation for people to drop things in the water. No, 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 we shouldn't do that. There's a temptation to let your bilge water flow out into the ocean or the bay. No, we have to be really careful about that. And to give us guidance on just what we can do to keep the waters that we sail and love to sail in and power around in, we brought two great guests with us today. Uh, Natasha uh, Dunn and Vivian Matuk are here to tell us all about how to tune up our clean boating practices. Uh, Natasha and Vivian, welcome very much to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, we're very enthusiastic about uh, your contribution to our sport and how we can keep our beautiful, clean waterways um, beautiful. Tell us all about it. We're all ears. Okay, well, thank you, Ron, so much, and happy Wednesday, everybody. Um, we're very excited to be with all of you today. Thank you for taking some time to refresh your memory about some clean and green uh, boating practices. I'm excited to be here with my colleague, Natasha Dunn, who will be presenting uh, right after I'm done. I'm the Environmental Boating Program Manager for both the California State Parks and the California Coastal Commission. <clears throat> So today, as part of our presentation, we're going to start from a bird's eye view perspective. You are all boaters, but it's always great to know the latest and greatest in terms of what's going on in boating in California. We're going to offer you many resources to support your clean and green boating practices. And due to the time limit that we have today, rather than talking about all the potential sources of boat pollution, we selected few to be able to share with you some tips and tricks so we can keep boating clean, green, safe, and fun. Remember, this is a program that has been developed based on California boaters for California boaters. So we're talking about what we know that you all know or don't know, and we're here to share with you this information as well as local resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. So California has one of the highest levels of recreational boating activity in our nation. For the last several years, California has ranked among the four top states with Michigan, Florida, and Minnesota with respect to the number of registered boats and recreational boaters. <clears throat> Currently, we have approximately 1 million registered boats, over 4 million recreational boaters, and the total annual economic impact of boating for our state is a little bit over uh, $11 billion. As California population increases, so does the popularity of boating as a recreational activity. Fortunately, we are in a beautiful state that offers us ample opportunities for boating. With over 1,200 miles of California coast, our beautiful delta, and thousands of lakes, people just want to go out and enjoy via our recreational boating, our beautiful estate. But we have to remember that if it's our boat, it's our responsibility. And you guys are good stewards of the environment, but it's always good to refresh our memory about some, some tips and tricks that we can implement to continue to have boating as a clean, green, safe, and fun activity. So this is a dynamic presentation. And uh, even though we're separated virtually today, we want you guys to be able to receive our free California Boater Kit. So uh, uh, right now or later on, after you're done watching or participating in this educational uh, virtual webinar, 
or seminar, feel free to go to the link that we're including in the, the slide right now. So you can take our two minute questionnaire, give us your shipping information and we'll send you the free California uh, voter kit. This is a comprehensive packet of clean and safe voting information that was developed based on research and input provided by our technical advisory group comprised of members with the marina industry and voting associations. In other words, the expert. And again, is information for you, California voters. So we're using a specific program for our state um, recreational voters. So let's talk about some clean voting practices. Again, there are so many more practices or potential sources of vote pollution that Natasha and I would, won't cover in this presentation because of the limited time, but you can always visit our website at votingcleanandgreen.com. <clears throat> so in terms of oil and hazardous waste, we all know that oil and hazardous waste, including fuel, contain hydrocarbons and heavy metals, which are highly toxic to human health and the aquatic environment. Let's check this uh, fact from the Environmental Protection Agency that says one gallon of oil from an oil change can ruin one million gallons of drinking water, which is the annual supply for 50 people. <clears throat> we are all educated. We know that oil and water do not mix. And also we know that <clears throat> when spills happen that can impact light penetration, oxygen exchange, uh, also it can impact as we all know, marine uh, life, birds, uh, mammals among others. Uh, so it's a very uh, impactful situation for um, the ecosystem. But um, how can spills occur? Spills often uh, occur be an, ac an accident. It could be like, well, we're filling up our tank, or that's the case sometimes with those boats that have a bilge system, inboard or inboard outboards. And as we all know, the bilge, which is the engine compartment, takes on water. That water can get mixed uh, with fluids coming from the engine, depending on how often you use your boat, how well maintained the engine is, and how old your uh, engine is. Most of the boats have installed on board an automatic bilge pump that you all know work as follows. When the bilge water reaches a certain level that activates a bilge sensor and that bilge water gets discharged via um, the automatic bilge pump and it's a safety mechanism, right? But of course, if we don't have a very clean bilge, like we're seeing in these pictures, which are not acceptable, then the opportunities for accidental discharges could be tremendous, right? So the first recommendation we want to remind you is that prevention is the key and the cheapest way to control pollution. And we always have to practice preventive engine maintenance by regularly inspecting our gasket, fuel lines, hoses, making sure the engine is well-tuned and operating at peak efficiency, plus always carrying on board an oil absorbent like the ones you're seeing in the upper left corner of your slide. Oil absorbents are very inexpensive pollution prevention tools that you can buy online or go to your favorite marine supply stores and get them. They are made up of a byproduct of the paper industry. They absorb oil, repels water, and they are found in many shapes, as you can see here. Sometimes you have the oil diaper. That's how a lot of people call it. I call them the oil sheet, which is very uh, uh, thin, so you can put it in shallow bilges, or you have the sock, or, the, or the, also the pillow. And these oil absorbents benefit any motorized vessel, as you can see in this slide, from outboards where in reality they don't have a true build to inboard and inboard outboards. Um, even sometimes I get to talk and I know a lot of the people in your beautiful yacht club um, do not have a motorized vessel and they said hey Vivian we don't need absorbents but I always tell people it is important that we all carry absorbents on board because you can witness one of your fellow boaters going through a spill or you can accidentally see a spill. So it's always good to carry these absorbents. But get what, get was, uh, guess what? In your boater kit that you will be receiving um, after you fill out the questionnaire, we are sending you two pollution prevention tools, two oil absorbents. The one that is the diaper would be the outside cover of the boater kit and the one on the left, which is uh, the pillow. <clears throat> the pillow absorbs up to a quart of oil 
And how you use it, pretty straightforward. You put it in the bilge. As you know, each boat is different. So you guys know your boat. You place it there. You secure it with a fabric loop and a releasable zip tie that comes with the pillow. So you can secure the pillow so it doesn't clog or foul your bilge sensor or your bilge pump. And please periodically inspect the absorbency. Once you see a little bit of the sheen on the bilge water, that means probably your pillow uh, um, uh, has, is totally saturated. At that point, don't put it in the trash. In California, it's considered hazardous waste. Uh, and this is the beauty of this program as well. We want to connect you with your local resources. California has many options for you to properly dispose of your used oil absorbents. Some clubs across the state offer what we call an oil absorbent exchange program. In other words, they distribute and collect absorbents, like you see here in this picture at the Oakland Yacht Club, one of your sister clubs in Alameda County. Once the oil absorbent is saturated with your gloves, remember our skin tend to absorb hazardous substances and we want your health to be, of course, protected. Put it in a bag or container away from sources of ignition or the heat and bring it to either your club or your marina if you have those services in place. But again, not all the marinas offer that service across the state. The good news is you can always bring your used oil absorbent to your county household hazardous waste collection center. We all pay in our trash fee a fee that give us the opportunity and the right to use our county household hazardous waste collection center. Vivian, how can I know where my household hazardous waste collection center is? Pretty straightforward. You can use your um, uh, favorite browser and say San Francisco County household hazardous waste collection center, or you can visit earth911.com, enter your zip code, the same with the 800 cleanup, and the information will tell you where the county household hazardous waste collection center is. Also, because you're here with us today and also for future listeners or watchers, as part of the boater kit, you're going to receive this beautiful map. It's the San Francisco Clean Boating Map, again, developed based on research. We have all the marinas with the pollution prevention services available to you that Natasha, when she talks about sewage, will be also highlighting to you. In the boater kit, we also have a tide book that not only provides you with the tides and current information, but also in the back you have by counties, even in inland areas, even though they are not impacted by the tides and currents, but we want boaters when they visit everywhere in uh, Northern California to leave no trace, you can identify where your pollution prevention services are. If you have a messy bilge, you may want to use a bilge pump out. California has 13 mainly at commercial harbors. For more information, you can just simple, simply use your browser bilge pump outs in California or this uh, website that I'm including there. So you can identify where the nearest um, is. Here in San Francisco, we have one at High Street Pier. One common question we get from boaters is, hey, what am I supposed to do if I face an accidental spill? So first of all, remember, we are not perfect machines, right? And accidents happen. The first thing we need to know is the law. Make sure that we all remember that anything, as you see in this slide, that causes a sheen on the water must be reported, especially if you are the responsible party. In the boater kit, you're going to receive these um, uh, environmental boating laws brochure where all the federal and state laws, most importantly, are included so you can refresh your memory about them and continue to support your clean boating practices. If you create, unfortunately, a spill, you have, uh, uh, you're responsible to report it, not only to your marina or your yacht club, where they have staff prepared to assist you, but also to both the National Response Center and the State Warning Center. That's if you are a responsible party. My friends, unfortunately, there's no options to say, oh, I'm not going to re report myself. Based on law, you have to do it. And I know you are good and responsible uh, people. But at the same time, it is important to understand that Federal and state agencies know that accidents happen. They may have even caused 
spills. But the important thing is to call and report it and also to keep in mind that small spills add up and the reporting agencies know that not all the time you're going to get a, a, a fine, as you can see in this slide. They analyze on a case-by-case -case basis. They know that accidents happen. The important thing is the um, encouraging to report the spills is to protect a potential public health or environmental impact. If you have a spill that is caused by oil or diesel, we use absorbents. You're going to start with the right food because we're going to send you the boat liquid with some of them. But if it's gasoline, please simply report it and clear the area because as you know, it's flammable and hazardous. So make sure that you have your absorbents in place, that you have your fire extinguisher in good conditions, knowing all the late, uh, lately uh, changes in regulations, and also handy the reporting phone numbers. In your voter kit, you're going to receive this fantastic uh, binder card where you have a, a, a section about who to call, where you can have those two information. And most importantly, you can add somewhere at, on top of the binder card, your Yacht Club phone number, just in case you have to have it handy. So everything good for you to make your life easier. And let's remember, it is illegal to use soaps or bilge cleaning products or dispersant to remove any uh, oil spill on the water. That's highly illegal because soaps make a lot of impact into the environment. It is illegal and, and that's what the, the law says. So let's keep that in mind. Another big um, message we want to share with you is to always recycle use, used oil and oil filters. So you guys are not only boaters, but you may have your own car. And it is important for all Californians to remember that oil is a natural resource that never wears out. It only gets dirty, but needs to be recycled many times, especially let's think about the current worldwide situation we're facing because of oil. So based on our research, we have identified that over 50% of voters are do-it-yourself oil changers. And even if you don't change your own oil and you hire a contractor, it's your responsibility to make sure that oil gets recycled. California, unfortunately, is not properly recycling over 20 million gallons of used oil on an annual basis. We can do better than this, but get excited. California has a fantastic system to properly recycle your used oil. There are two systems. One, you can go to a certified used oil collection center. Uh, that could be a marina, auto part, or gas station, where you will find the logo you see in this slide. They accept oil up to five gallons at a time, and you can, and they can pay you 40 cents per gallon. Or there are other facilities that do not want to be certified, but they may char charge you or not for a fee. If you have oil that is contaminated with water or something else, in that case, you have to go to your county household hazardous waste collection center because that oil cannot be recycled. And we already talked about how to identify your own county household hazardous waste collection center. Uh, these are examples for you to show you that in reality they exist, that these are marinas certified by the state as used oil collection center. You see uh, uh, one marina in San Mateo County, Brisbane Marina. Down below we have Marina del Rey, beautiful in LA County, full service marina. But also just to give you an example, when you drive your car and you need your oil change, these are facilities where you can also bring your car uh, not only for oil recycling, but also uh, oil filter recycling. And you can identify the nearest center to you, not only by checking your map that you will be receiving, but also the resources that we have here, 800 cleanup and the earth911.com. Another option for potential accidental spill comes from fueling, because we know uh, that Boat, uh, boat fueling systems are open compared to the car fueling system. And unfortunately, uh, the fuel tank vent that allows the vapors to escape is one of the primary places where spills could happen or could occur during fueling. Some of the tips we want to recommend you to keep in mind is always keep safety in mind. Make sure that nobody's on board. 
uh, people are not smoking while they fill up the tank. And I'm sorry if I'm making this comment and you're thinking Vivian is silly, but it's true. I have personally seen a lot of things happening out there. Uh, make sure that the fuel nozzle is in contact with the fuel tube to avoid a static. Pay attention to the uh, to the tank when it's uh, uh, almost full because you, you can hear a change in the tone. Uh, also consider not topping off the tank, just leave it up to 90% capacity because as you know, when temperature increases, the fuel or diesel tend to expand. So we don't those we don't want those spills to happen. And educate yourself about different pollution prevention tools that you can find at marine supply stores. So make your life easier. Some of them include, for example, the oil absorbent sheet that you will be receiving. You can also use it to catch any potential leak or drip when you're filling up your tank or also a fuel donut that you can see here <clears throat> in your slide. There are also on Marine Supply Store these no spill bottle that you can put on top of the fuel tank vent to capture any back pressure spills or get excited. In your boater kit, we're also going to send you a third pollution prevention tool, which is the fuel beep you can see right now in your slide. Um, you can use it as you can see on the right um, uh, hand side of your slide. Once you use it, it is reusable, so you can store it away from sources of ignition or the heat in a bag or container and use it many times. But because it's fuel or diesel, make sure that if you need to properly dispose of it once it's saturated, you can bring it to your county household hazardous waste collection center. This is a new device that I run into a few months back. Uh, that is a great device you can also explore. You put it in your boat diesel fuel uh, deck filler, you insert the fuel nozzle here and it catches um, a, a back pressure spills as well here. So there are many options as well as inline fuel air uh, separators. You guys sometimes deal with hazardous waste. We already talked about the fact that each county has a way to serve you. Uh, by uh, calling those county household hazardous waste, you can bring these hazardous waste for proper disposal. Um, and in terms of flares, flares are a big issue in California. And actually, let me tell you that is nationwide. Uh, this is a problem that we're trying to solve for many, many years. Uh, traditional flares contain tons of toxics. So we want to invite all boaters to transition to the new uh, non-pyrotechnic uh, flares that are Coast Guard approved, um, including in your boater kit. Look, everything is ready in your boater kit. Uh, this discount coupon you can get uh, to transition from your traditional flare to the electronic flares. These are great flares. You don't, they are reusable. You don't deal with all these crazy toxics or the disposing of the traditional flares. The last topic before I switch to my colleague, Natasha, who is full of information as well, is trash and marine debris. I know you guys are, especially in your club, really care about this topic a lot. And it's a sad topic that is impacting uh, the entire uh, planet. Unfortunately, a study from the University of Georgia uh, shows that on an annual basis, approximately 8 million metric tons of plastic waste enter our ocean every year from waste mismanagement and littering. If you are like me, I cannot understand what 8 million metric tons of plastic means. So it's the equivalent of emptying a garbage truck of plastic into the ocean every minute. We know that boaters are not the main polluters, but because we are at the end of the watershed, we are getting impacted by all this trash and marine debris that comes from the upper part of the watershed. But the important thing is just for us to implement some quick, easy practices. The first one, again, know your laws, check your environmental laws for that. If you have a boat that is over a 26 feet in length, make, make sure that you have on board your marine pollution placard, the one that I'm see, showing you here, you can buy it at marine supply stores. If you have a boat that is over 40 uh, feet uh, in, in, in length, make sure you have a trash management plan on board also. Avoid excess packaging and stash your trash. Clean up litter and debris you see on the water. For my friends who are smokers, remember that keep cigarette butts out of the water. They are made up of plastic and they last like diamonds forever. 
swap it. Invest in reusable coffee mugs, water bottles, straws, grocery bags, etc. Say no to single-use plastics at your events, even at your club events, at your regattas, and we are with you. The new approach to marine debris is reuse and refill. We know a study that was recently released, actually this week, recycling is less than 5%. So it's, and it's a very complicated process. And participate in our annual Coastal Cleanup Day program. I represent one of the agencies that manage the Coastal Cleanup Day, which is the largest volunteer event in California. Write down, and I want the San Francisco Yacht Club to be on board next year. It's going to be on September 23rd. If you want to participate, like this year uh, we had it in September, we had 49 boating facilities and boating groups across the state participating, even on the water, because you have the skills to navigate. Let me know. I'll be super excited to work with you on that. Now I'm going to shift gears and be quiet and turn the presentation over to Natasha, who's always uh, full of great information. <laughs> Thanks, Vivian. <laughs> Natasha, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, so I want, to interject, I want to interject the comment that we sailors and power boaters uh, are enthusiastic to hear what we can do to uh, basically um, contribute to your efforts to improve, you know, water health and get rid of debris because yes, we're using uh, the water resources every day, all the time. And we're the most active folks really in the aquatic community since we're uh, riding around. So when there is a way that we can harness the volunteer energy of the St. Francis Yacht Club, feel free to invite us to uh, contribute any way we can. Uh, previous speakers uh, have invited us to use little you know, GPS tracking devices, when we see big, uh, uh, bad nets, ghost nets in the ocean, uh, and to make sure that we have all of our friends who fish in the Yacht Club be real careful with their, um, you know, crab nets, make sure they have the right kind of lines. And we, uh, we want to learn all about your um, guidance with regard to new thinner lines for all these nets, because uh, lots of research is being done to make sure that we don't trap our whales and mammals in the ocean with fishing activity. So uh, our ears are wide open to hear how we can help there. We can, um, if, if Natasha may, uh, because I know we have a, a limited time. Uh, I manage also the California Fishing Line Recycling Program. There are a couple of stations near you guys because I work with the San Francisco Marina. And we have currently 360 fishing line recycling stations across the state. That line has been able to be collected and properly recycled. And if you stretch the line at this point, it will stretch from San Francisco to uh, La Paz, Bolivia, after all the effort that we have been doing. So I'll be happy to work with you if you feel that in your club we can install a station. That would be fantastic. But uh, um, there are many opportunities. So I'll let Natasha continue with um, the sewage topic. Got it. Working. Great. Thanks for having us. Um, and thanks, Vivian. Uh, so I work with the Division of Boating and Waterways on a Clean Vessel Act grant program, which is funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund, which is a fancy way of saying that I work with marinas to help um, get them to install pump outs within the region, and I work with boaters to help uh, underst them understand the need to use them. Next slide. So why care about sewage? I understand that there's so many other sources of pollutants out there. We've got cargo ships, we've got cruise ships, we've got stormwater, we've got trash, you know, all of these things contribute. But as Vivian said, we've got over 4 million recreational boaters in California and the impact of those, that, that sewage can really be substantial. So sewage, as we know, contains nutrients that um, cause algal blooms, unwanted plant growth, and fish kills, particularly in less dynamic waters, such as dead-end flues up in the Delta. Um, as we know, bacteria and viruses can make us sick um, and contaminate shellfish beds as well as fish stocks and eventually closed beaches sometimes. And then more importantly, chemical additives that uh, are added to holding tanks as deodorizers can, can contain um, formaldehyde, they contain perfumes, dyes, which are not good for human health or the aquatic environment. You can see on the uh, photo here, there's a, a, a sailboat that's got a dye tab that's been dropped in the holding tank and its Y valve is stuck open. And so you can see it's trailing uh, Y tab, excuse me, it's trailing Y tab, but it's also trailing sewage behind it. Next slide, please. So what's on board and what are our options? Of course, the, the ideal is to use onshore facilities. 
Um, but those ha typically have three different options they can use. Porta potties, uh, little small options, composting toilets, which we're finding are becoming much more um, much more m popular with boaters. They don't have a septic, septic holding tank. There's no through hole fittings, fewer moving parts. They do uh, need a little bit more uh, room to install, but those are great options as well if you can look into one of those. Um, and then there's also uh, obviously installed heads with marine sanitation devices or MSCs as we call them. Uh, next slide, please. So this next slide is a little bit confusing. It, it basically goes over different types of MSCs. There's three types of MSCs essentially. There's one, type one, type two, and type three. And I'll kind of go through this, uh, this diagram here real quick. On the top left, we've got direct discharge through hull, which has been illegal since 1972. So if this is your configuration, you're overdue for a new system. In the middle top, we've got portable or composting toilets. Again, really great options if you want to look into those. And then on the top right side is a little less of a common. It's a type three, which is a holding tank with just uh, just getting pumped out. This is a little bit less less common, um, but the type three is really the holding tank uh, situation. The bottom left, we've got a type three, again, holding tank. The key here is that it's got a Y valve or a diverter valve that, you, that goes either through hole or up to the deck waste um, fitting to get pumped out. And then the, the final one on the bottom right is the type one MSC. They're skipping type two, but type one and type two MSCs are basically uh, treat sewage via maceration or some sort of biological an or anaerobic treatment process where you can thereby potentially discharge that treated sewage through hole. Um, these these uh, type one and type two uh, systems have really specific fecal coliform limits, so it's really critical to keep your uh, system well maintained. Uh, prevention is everything. Next slide, please. I get a lot of questions um, about uh, Y valves from boaters who maybe don't understand what kind of system they've got. Y valves play, those diverter valves play a really important role when we're talking about discharge into the waterways. Uh, like I mentioned on the last slide, they're diverter valves that either go overboard or to the deck for pumping out. Uh, for this reason, we recommend it's always just best to keep your Y valve secured and closed in the locked position. Um, you can see on the left hand side, there's a couple different kinds and it's important to get to know yours, whether you can zip tie it, whether you can take off the handle altogether, where you can put a, um, a little lock on it to keep it to keep it secure within the three mile limit. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to boaters or to to marina boat uh, marina staff or to pump out mobile pump out guys who who you know have boaters come up to a dock ready to pump out and there's nothing there because they've had their Y valve stuck in the open position the whole time. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's go over some rules and regs for discharge. Next slide, please. Federal law prohibits the discharge of untreated sewage from vessels within the, three, within the navigable waters of the U.S. within three miles of shore and most bays and estuaries. Only type one and type two are the ones that treat, that treat sewage. And again, your system's really got to perform properly in order to discharge safely into waters. If you've got one of those systems, again, know the fecal coliform limits for discharge and where you can discharge. And again, best practice is to just really secure that wide valve. You can also get a hold of dive tabs um, to drop in your holding tank, and some marinas will, um, you know, will do that for you. Um, or you can get a hold of it yourself at a marine supply store to see if you've got any leaks or if your wide valve happens to be open. Next slide, please. There are also places you can't discharge at all. You all probably know this, marine and, marinas and yacht harbors, uh, freshwater lakes and impoundments, swimming waiting areas, poorly flushed areas, and rivers that do not support interstate traffic. Uh, these are all pretty basic you know, pl places that we all know that um, environmental boating laws um, brochure that Vivian mentioned is gonna come in the boater kit is a really, really useful resource in terms of the rules and the specific rules and regs. Uh, next slide, please. Also, no discharge zones. We've got two of them up here in Northern California that you all probably know, the Richardson, Richardson Bay No Discharge Zone and Lake Tahoe. There's a lot of smaller ones in Southern California. Um, if you're a boater down there, it's important to, to understand where those are as well. Next slide, please. We've also got some really uh, large marine sanctuaries off our coast, as you all know, that uh, are protected areas that support really ecologically rich marine systems. While type one and type two MSCs, if performing properly, can discharge su treated sewage here. Keep in mind these units still contain chemicals and nutrients that will get into the waterways. Um, so no treated, no untreated sewage is allowed in these areas. And they are the Greater Fairlawns up top, Port Bank below, and then down to the South Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Next slide, please. 
So a couple resources for voters that we've got around sewage. Uh, the state has created Pump Out Nav, which is a free iOS and Android um, app that you can download and it'll tell you where the nearest participating pump out dump station and inland floating restrooms are near you. Uh, you can log your pump outs. You can uh, find out exactly where the units are in the marinas, choose your favorites, and you can report problems to the marina managers. Next slide, please. We also have some free boaters, excuse me, some free resources that we'll send out to you. Uh, this one here is a hands-free deck adapter kit in two sizes. We've got one and a quarter and one and a half inch. They screw into your deck waist fitting so you can skip that nozzle that often is missing anyhow and use the universal clamp uh, for hands-free pump out. These adapter kits are free to order at ssestuary.org slash boating. Next slide, please. We've also got some nice Y-Valve educational kits that we um, can send out. Those contain uh, rules and regs, uh, zip ties for securing your Y-Valve, an enzymatic digester pod, and a dye tab for uh, testing if you've got any leaks or if you've, your Y-Valve is open. Again, you can order these free from us at ssestuary.org slash voting. Next slide, please. Additionally, we offer maps and guides uh, of clean boating that, uh, facilities that we drop off at marinas each quarter. Uh, you can pick up one of these. We also help publish clean boating uh, newsletters, such as the Changing Tide. We're active on social media, and we also present at yacht clubs like this and at boat shows as well and hand out our resources. Next slide, please. And then finally, recently, uh, in partnership with DBW, we've developed a podcast called Dockside that we're, we're proud of. Uh, it's downloadable on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Amazon Music. Um, and the podcast show, really showcases several topics around clean boating and safe boating practices. Uh, since April 2022 this, of this year, we've uh, done five episodes, and they've been downloaded over 900 times. Next slide, please. So just a couple of general sewage tips to wrap it up. Uh, use onshore facilities when possible. Uh, find near about pump outs and dump stations with pump out nav. Really get to know your MSD and choose less toxic products. Keep your Y valve securely closed within the three mile limit to prevent accidental discharge. Know your rules and regs around your discharge zone areas in particular. And use your fellow boaters and marinas as resources. Slide please. And I'll turn it back over to you, Vivian. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. Great information. So just to wrap it up, just to make uh, Ron happy in terms of our limit time, <laughs> make sure that you guys uh, get your free California Boater Kit full of information. Again, we want you to uh, continue to implement clean boating practices. So uh, don't forget to visit the link that we have there for you. Also get from Natasha's team the adapter kit or and or the Y-Valve kit. We're going to include at the end of the presentation our contact information in case you're missing some of the URLs and you're like, hey, just tell me what I need to do. Uh, make sure that you know your laws and apply all the quick tips and tricks we just share with you. Again, this is a program for you guys that is based on California information. So as you saw, we have resources from California uh, specifically uh, for you guys. Um, use the pollution prevention services we share with you and uh, talk to your peers and uh, spread the word out. We have the website uh, right there in case you want to learn more about other potential sources of boat pollution that due to time we didn't um, keep in mind or share with you today. Tons of great information in our website. Um, again, this is the border kit with the link. And uh, that's our contact information. And also, of course, Ron and his team um, have our contact information in case you want to email us. We love to talk to boaters, so happy to attend um, your phone call or any email that you may want to send us. Um, and that <laughs> is, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much for updating us on your activities. Uh, a couple of important questions. First of all, what are the most destructive recreational boating activities when it comes to estuary health or water health? Wow, great, great question. I would say uh, without having, um, you know, hard data right now in front of me that everything adds up. Right, because for example, boaters get really concerned when there's an oil spill because, of course, it's something that stays in the system. The the complexity of the hazardous material takes so much time and so much effort for the ecosystem to be able to 
process it if in a way it is processed unlike sewage and that's Natasha's main topic because people say oh well but what what's the problem with sewage if sewage is organic and it doesn't matter the system is going to process it but we have to remember that both are complex and we have many people on the water and we need to be responsible because at one point we're going to go over the equilibrium point of the ecosystem right so for example hydrocarbons take a long time to be processed if in a way that gets processed because there's a lot of toxicity that stays in the ecosystem uh, uh, in terms of sewage wait wait, wait pause. when you say hydrocarbons uh, for our less scientific uh, members, <laughs> exactly, me, like oil and fuel, diesel, um, those are part of the hydrocarbons, right? So they are very complex and very toxic. Uh, Natasha mentioned about sewage, and a lot of people don't care about sewage because it dissipate, dissipates, quote unquote, fast enough. But in reality, we all know that the amount of nutrients we're putting into the ecosystem, like Natasha said, the amount of bacteria and viruses and other chemicals that we as humans are taking, for example, antibiotics, medicines, contraceptives, that the ecosystem is not uh, capable of processing that. That adds up. And we do not, we need to talk about marine debris because we all know about trash and recyclables. I don't know, and Natasha, if you want to add up anything else. No, I would say that, you know, the Bay is a really dynamic system down here, and it's sometimes a little less apparent how sewage affects uh, water quality down here in the Bay. I would say uh, I've got a lot of experience in, in the Delta, and there's a, a ton of, you know, invasives in the Delta, there's nutrients that get in the water, and, they, you know, especially like I mentioned on the dead end flues, they that really adds up to, to plant growth um, and, and a lot of invasive, you know, invasive growth. So I, I think that's the sewage piece that, you know, particularly affects um, boaters in the Delta. So, for instance... Uh, what's the half-life in the ecosystem or in a body of water of like an oil drop versus human waste, you know, sewage? Uh, it seems to me that the long, you know, polycarbons in oil take a real long time to break down. Do you have any scientific data that you could just share with us? It's not necessary that our audience know about it, but it's clear that oil is way worse than uh, bio waste in the water. Natasha, do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? <laughs> um, I don't know about oil. I'll, I'll leave you with the oil and I can talk about it. Yeah, sure. So, for example, let's picture what happened last year, Ron, as you may remember, as well as our audience in Orange County with the uh, spill that unfortunately we had last year in October. I was working supporting the Coast Guard and the Office of Spill Prevention and Response and working with our boaters down there to make sure that they were safe, their boats were decontaminated. And it took for us, I would say, almost a full month of full activity constantly just to monitor the, uh, the characteristic of that oil that was spilled as well as the trajectory. Because once the oil is released into the environment, even though, of course, that particular spill wasn't created by boaters by any means, was the industry, right, an accidental spill there. The system takes a while to be able to process it, even though there are currents, et cetera, but they stay in the ecosystem for quite some time, depending on the amount of oil that gets a spill, the characteristic of the spill, and the characteristic of the chemical that gets a spill and the amount. So it would be difficult to say it stays in the ecosystem for X amount of time, because all those factors play such an important role, as well as the current, the tides, and also, as you know, there are long-term impacts, right? Tissues from the organisms that are in the area that get impacted, birds, among others. In terms of sewage, I would say we don't really think about it in terms of half-life. I think we term think about it in terms of, you know, impacts that happen right away. Um, you know, shellfish bed contamination, um, surfers getting sick, you know, I, obviously a lot of the, the the beach, you know, closures that happen aren't necessarily from boater sewage, they're from, you know, larger treatment facilities. But again, that just sort of demonstrates that, that the impacts from sewage tend to be pretty quick and pretty acute, you know, people get sick, shellfish beds get contaminated, um, you know, invasive species grow within, you know, a, a, a fairly quick amount of time. Um, so I think, you know, that, that red tide that happened in the Bay a couple months back, I think that's a good indication of what happens when lots of nutrients are dumped into, uh, into a, a body of water. 
So nextly, give me a little organizational overview. Uh, you represent two different organizations, Vivian, you're with the California Coastal Commission and Natasha, you're with San Francisco Estuary Clean Vessel Program. So who's funding the California Coastal Commission? Let's do that one first. And where do you report up to? Who do you report up to? Yeah, so let me just clarify. I'm actually with the California State Parks and the California Coastal Commission. Oh, so right. my, my program was originally created by the commission back in the year 2000, but throughout all these years, it has been moved and was part of the Department of Boating and Waterways. And you know that now the department is a division of the California State Parks. But we had a reorganization within the California State Parks. So now my program, which serves the mission of the Division of Boating and Waterways, it gets a little bit complicated, is part of the Interpretation and Education Division of the State Parks. Because actually what I do is education and outreach. My program uh, is mainly funded through the Harbors and Watercraft Revolving Fund which comes from the Division of Boating and Waterways, from boaters to serve you guys. That's why we love to do education and properly connect with research and great information, all the information to uh, properly serve you. In the case of uh, Natasha, let her respond to your question. Yeah, thanks. So I work for the San Francisco Estuary Partnership, which is a national estuary program uh, based under the EPA. We apply, we've applied actually for quite a number of years now um, for an education and outreach grant through the Division of Boating and Waterways. They get funding through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do two things, to, to help marinas install um, pump outs via grants, pump out stem stations and floating restrooms through um, grants. And they also work to educate boaters on the importance of pumping out. And so what my organization does, we apply for grants to do education and outreach. We also end up monitoring marinas uh, throughout the Bay, the Delta, and the, and the um, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, Monterey area to look at the pump outs and recommend to the Division of Boating and Waterways where we need new ones, who's having a problem, who might need a new one. Um, so we do kind of a mixture of monitoring and education and outreach. So nextly, uh, 10 years ago, if someone would say that electric cars are going to dominate the roadways, uh, they would have been kind of laughed out of the room. And now, of course, the market cap of Tesla is greater than the big three automakers. Well, we're the big three automakers. Uh, actually, the big five, big five biggest automakers all put together. So the move to electric cars uh, is dramatic, irreversible, and no longer controversial. It's a, a given fact. I've also seen the same thing happen on waterways. That is to say, I'm beginning to see more and more electric engines go to West Marine. You'll see them for sale uh, in stores. And friends of mine have actually added electric motors, even to old classic wooden boats like my 85-year-old youngster. And so uh, are you beginning to see electric electrification in the waterways? How early is it? And tell us what you see of it. Yeah, um, we have seen a lot of different new technologies being tested, which is fantastic. I, I think it goes along with the mission of the boaters, right? Because boaters are such a good stewards of the environment that you guys try to do as many things as possible just to be um, in synchrony with nature, right? So uh, Natasha and I actually went to a big event at Delta Dura a few months back. Uh, and we saw a couple of uh, solar panel powered uh, boats, which was fantastic to see. Uh, also, we have seen for many, many years, even I think more than 10 years ago, how the ferry industry actually here in San Francisco started using some of the ferries, using the, the solar energy powered uh, ferries. And I have seen more and more when we visit uh, marinas, I think, People are still a little bit hesitant trying just to understand, okay, how is this going to work? But, you know, it's, I think it's a great opportunity because even though the power boats are going to stay in the market for many, many years and people are going to still use them, the fact that you're embracing new technologies, uh, it is fantastic. And I think that's the, the way to go. I don't know, Natasha, if you want to say something else. Just that I think it's exciting that the infrastructure is going to, you know, absolutely explode in terms of the ability to, um, you know, to, to go solar to storage and, you know, electricity storage. I think, you know, over the next 10 years, I think it's, we're going to make leaps and bounds. And I think those benefits are really going to benefit voters as well. Yeah, and also it's like uh, because they, of the carbon footprint, right? Uh, people are always looking for ways to reduce your carbon footprint. And I think that that's going to be a very good way of 
um, you know, getting involved in a new wave, a new wave in terms of voting. Great. So I think uh, there used to be this division between the ecologists and the commercial fishermen. And I've seen uh, an increasing alliance between the two. Friends of mine, um, Gene Brown, who is a professional fisherman up in Bodega Bay, uh, actually has told me, Ron, what we all need to do, we fishermen and recreational boaters, we all need to pay attention to how clean uh, we can make the water. Because in reality, he believes that uh, polluted waterways are worse fisheries and actually have a very, very significant increasing negative effect on not only their way of life, but uh, you know the future health of the oceans, which affects all of us. So I'm seeing an increasing alliance between commercial interest and consumer interest and recreational interest. Are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, totally. We we see the same thing. Um, and I think is sometimes I feel like people want to do the right thing, but they don't know how to do it. So that's why uh, programs like this that Ron and your club are putting together, the more education we get, the better. Uh, even in the commercial industry, um, you see how even the public as a consumer is really pushing the industry to try to, okay, put yourself together. We want something that is more environmentally uh, uh, friendly. And I think, unfortunately, we are um, facing a lot of environmental problems uh, when people go and buy fish, uh, that sometimes the fish you wanted to eat, even though it's the season, is not there yet or the state is saying please don't fish because the population is pretty low that I think people are realizing hey we're reaching a point that is not good and we need to make a change and um, we are environmental educators so we always feel we want to be positive and and try to push the industry to do always a better job but it's up to us to also make smart and good decisions pro environment so uh Natasha Dunn of the San Francisco Estuary Clean Vessel Program and Vivian Matuk of Cal State Parks and Coastal Commission. We uh, thank you very much for joining our first live stream on YouTube. We're just experimenting with this new technology. We're great that you guys would join us uh, on our program. We all stand to gain by observing clean boating activities not just those of us who love to sail and power around in our boats on the waterways, but citizens in the world who all of which benefit from clean oceans. And um, you know, we recognize that the oceans have the best ability to actually uh, help clean the atmosphere because three quarters of the earth is oceans. And we believe that healthy oceans are really, really important just as much as trees as a matter of fact. In fact, there's some statistics by recent speakers who point out that the oceans actually may contribute as much as all the trees on earth to uh, clean, uh, cleaning our environment and our atmosphere, but we have to keep them clean in order for them to function like that. So thanks very much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the Yacht Club and helping you support, uh, bring this message to other Yacht Clubs all around the country. Thanks so much. And with Thank that, we so join. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. With that, we join. We adjourn.